Jesus. Can you say amen? amen? Amen. And so I want you to turn to Psalm chapter 16, verse 11, for your convenience. We have it on our screens to the left and the right of our stage. Just one verse, and I'm going to be pulling from that verse. Amen? You will show me the path of life. In your presence is the fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. I want to drop back to that phrase where it says, in your presence, in your presence is fullness, absolute fullness of joy. And I want to use for a simple subject this morning, tapping into joy. That's, that's going to be my subject this morning, tapping into into joy. Lord, bless your word today in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Y'all all right? I want to just shout out to all the men who gathered on yesterday for our men's monthly meeting. Come on, all the men, holler at me. They had an impactful time out here. Uh, the brothers were testifying when I came in about how yokes were being broken and God had tapped into some things that they were going through in their lives. So I want to encourage all of my sisters and all of my brothers in here to be a part of that meeting. Our men's monthly meeting is held the second Saturday of every month. It may not always be held here at the church. And that location that we do have, it will be forwarded to you. But it is a time for us to bond, to break yokes, to change the lives of men. If you're dating somebody, if you're engaged to somebody, amen, if you're married to somebody, I want you to encourage them, amen, just encourage them to come on out here. In fact, some of y'all that are dating somebody, this will be the test. Yeah, you talking about you want to date me, you're going to have to be after God's heart. If they act funny and act like they ain't got time to be bothered with the things of God, it might be a good sign. You don't want to be with them. Oh, y'all. Y'all getting tight. Yeah, you got to test these jokers. got to vet them. See what I'm saying? Get out here and get with some good brothers that are strengthening each other and getting strong in the Lord and allowing God. I believe in having all of us as a group and having all of us together, but sometimes there are some gender-specific things that we have to address. And so we know on the third Thursday, First Lady Faison does her Zoom call with all the ladies on the She platform. But for the men, it's the second Saturday. And I want you to put it on your calendar and make every effort to be a part of that. Can you say amen? amen. Also, I want to underscore something Lady Andrea, uh, Adrian pointed out to us is that we're going to be having our volunteer meeting here. Was that the third Saturday? September 23rd, I want you to make every effort to be a part of that, of that meeting. We gave you enough time so that you can move some things around to be a part of that meeting. It's not going to be an all-day thing, but we do need your attention for a few hours so that we can make sure that we're all on the same page. God is blessing our church and our ministry, and it's growing, and we're so happy to see all the new faces that are coming a part of it. And we just want to make sure that we're all singing out the same songbook, that we're all going in the same direction. Amen. If you are a leader, listen, I'm just going to say this to you. Don't expect people to follow your instruction to come to your meetings if you don't go to leadership training yourself. Uh, it is an indictment against you whenever you as a leader uh, and uh, expect your people to move their calendars around, do all the things they need to do to be a part of your meeting, and you don't do it yourself. People don't do what you say, they do what you do. I done stole somebody's joy. Amen. If you're sitting next to a leader, just hunch him and say, he's talking to you. I don't want to hear about grandma had a bake sale and I had to be there, you know, except for death or some dismemberment or something like that. I'm looking for all of my leaders. I'm looking over my glasses because it, it to me, uh, is a sign of great leadership that you be connected to the vision of this church, lest we have division. I'm going to leave it alone. But that's not my subject today. <laughs> I missed y'all. I did. I couldn't wait to get back. Look, Psalm 1611. First, first, I'm going to talk about tapping into joy. First, first, we want to distinguish between joy and happiness. These two words are often used synonymously, but they're really quite different. Happiness is, as it implies, it is rooted in circumstances. It depends on something that's happening, something good, something favorable. When something good happens, 
happiness is what we experience. And consequently, when something bad occurs, uh, we have the opposite effect, right? We have sadness. We have depression. We have anger. We have frustration. And so what's happening is many of us are on a roller coaster of our emotions because the things that make you happy and make you sad can change from moment to moment. One minute I'm happy, the next minute I'm sad. One minute I'm dancing, the next minute I'm crying. It, it can change all the time depending on what may be happening in your life. And sometimes it changes from moment to moment. Anybody ever had it happen? That within the space of an hour, you could be happy and dancing and joyful, and before this hour is over, get a text on your phone that changes your whole mood. Or you could be having a great time, glad to be in the service, and somebody could say something wrong to you and change your whole mood. That's because happiness changes according to circumstances. I jumped in my car. I was ready to go to church. I was excited. Got out front and had a flat tire. <clears throat> and your whole mood changes. You follow what I'm saying? Just get ready to go out the door. And just as I'm going out the door, the baby throw up on my shirt and the whole mood changes. And maybe I decide to stay home. Because circumstances change all the time. That's where happiness is found. It's a roller coaster ride. The founding fathers of the, of the, of the United States wrote in the Constitution that every man has the right, get this, to life liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, over 200 years ago, they understood that happiness is a pursuit, that it's something that we'll always be chasing after and never quite get our hands on. That happiness, to be true, is an elusive experience. That is always something we're trying to get our hands on, we're trying to pursue, we're always changing, always chasing it. We wake up every day saying, what can I do today to be happy. I hope something happens to me today to make me happy. I hope I get an extra little bit of money in my check today. I hope I get a promotion. I hope my honey tell me that they love me. I hope something happens to make me happy. I'm going to turn a corner here. Most pastors, to be quite honest with you, most pastors I know are really like people pleasers, right? So what we're trying to do is we're constantly creating and recreating programs and ministries aimed at get this to make people happy because we figure if we make you happy then you'll stay so what we'll do jp we'll bend and we'll change and we'll contort and we'll change things around and we'll move things around trying to accommodate your desire to be happy and so we're always checking your temperature. Maybe we start this. Maybe we have that. Maybe we change this. And, and here's what's really interesting. Sometimes after you've done all this bending and changing and contorting, the people that you change for, they leave anyway. So you change the whole program. And it's not a diss. It's just that people's appetites for what makes them happy changes all the time. And so when you're changing things to accommodate people's attitudes or moods or, or, attitudes or happiness or checking their happy meter, sometimes they'll be happy about what we picked for the music, and then sometimes they're not. And sometimes they'll be happy we had a program for them, and then sometimes they're not. And so as pastors, because we always want to make people happy, we try to contort and change and move things around to fit people's appetite. Let me go here. We are raising a generation of children who have a sense of entitlement because somebody told them that the world exists to make you happy. Who told you that? I'm not your mama. <laughs> And so you go out into the world, you go out to the workplace, you go out into the community, and you want everybody to be like your mama and give you cookies and ice cream and pat your little bottom to make you happy because you think that the world exists to make me happy. And if you don't do what makes me happy, I'm out of here. Can I go deeper? The ever-elusive pursuit of happiness has negatively impacted many marital relationships because you think that it's somebody else's job to make you happy all the time. Y'all done got quiet. Here's what's true. It's nobody's job to make you happy. I got one clap. It's nobody's job to make you happy. You don't want a spouse. You want an entertainer. You, you want a circus performer. You want somebody who's tap dancing all the time to make you happy. 
and they spend their daily existence trying to come up with ways to make you happy, to make you joyful, to make you excited. And God help you if you're attached to some narcissistic personality who insists that if you don't do what I want you to do to make me happy, I'll find somebody else who will do it. God help you if you're living with somebody who, who constantly threatens you. If you don't push my happy meter, if you don't make me happy, if you don't jump up and down, do you want it over here? Do you want it over there? Do you want it on the stairs? If you don't do all that stuff for me, then I'm going to go out here and find me somebody else. You will. You're right, sis. That's my thought, too. Go ahead. Go ahead and get them. Because here's what's true. They're going to leave you and go get somebody else hoping that they'll make them happy. That won't work. Then they'll get with somebody else and hoping that they'll make you happy. And pretty soon you'll realize that the problem is not with other people. The problem is with them. That there's something in them that is not being addressed, that is not being satisfied, and you keep thinking it's people because you think it's other people's job to make you happy. I found this out that even if you change to accommodate what they're asking for, my sister, they still gonna leave you. Because once people make up their mind that they don't want to be with you, you can stand on your head, you can jump up and down, you can spin around three times, and after you did all that bending and changing and losing weight and gaining weight and changing your hair and fixing all this, they'll still walk out because the real issue is they're trying to satisfy something through you that they need to have satisfied through themselves. Footnote, I'm going to say this to you, stop marrying people who are not happy with themselves. That's for my single people. I'm going to say it again. Stop marrying people who are not happy with themselves. I know it sounds romantic. You make me so happy. But the truth is, it is nobody's job to make you happy. And if you sign up for somebody hoping to make them happy, you are signing up for a job that you are not equipped for because what they need is not external. It is internal. Oh, I'm going to ride it. I'm going to ride it till I break it. They're searching for something through you that they can only get from themselves. And if they're not happy with themselves, they're not going to be happy with you. I can go home on that one. As believers, get this, beloved. As believers, I'm going to mess somebody up. God, Leah, never promised you that you'd be happy. He never promised you happiness. God promised you joy. And the problem is, your your issue with God is, you want him to make you happy. He didn't promise you happiness. He promised you joy. Happiness is not a fruit of the Spirit. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. That joy is a constant state of well-being that taps into the life of God that already exists within us. Jesus said this in one place. He said, he that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, that out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. That word belly means well. It's not your stomach. It's out of your belly, out of your wellspring, out of your innermost being. It alludes to a well that is fed with an underground stream. The reason why you can dip into a well and pull out water anytime you want is because it's constantly being fed by something that is underground, not just above the ground. And so when you tap into the life of God, you have to realize that what I'm looking for is not going to be coming from the external, it's coming from the internal. But as I'm tapped into God, as I'm tapped into the spirit of God, that out of that place, out of that inner place would come the water that I need to live my life. Joy is not something that I have to seek. It's already possible. I already possess it. I just have to tap into it. Ooh. Is it possible that all the things that you're doing right now to be happy, And all the things and all the people that you're being frustrated with because they don't make you happy. Is it possible that you already possess whatever you need to have joy? When you tap into this, what you realize, you'll discover that true joy, get this, is limitless 
It is life-defining. It is transformative. It runs deep. And then it overflows into your life. What am I saying? The thing that makes your life worth living doesn't flow from the outside. It flows from the inside. And the frustration you're experiencing is that you're trying to put something in you that never satisfies when God has already put something down in you that will flow into the rest of the parts of your life. There's nothing worse than living with somebody who is unhappy with their own life. Real joy is a practice. It is a behavior. It is a mindset. It comes from the heart. It transcends my immediate circumstances because it doesn't change according to what's happening around me. Happiness is always changing because of what's happening around me. But joy is constant. Happiness is always translating and transforming, but joy is constant. It is consistent. I can always tap into it. The issue that I have with the saints today is that we don't always tap into it. And so what happens is our worship services seem to be schizophrenic. They're up and they're down and they're up and they're down. And one Sunday we can come in and we're throwing chairs everywhere. And the other Sunday we act like we're super glued to the chair. You know what it is? Because we give our praise based on happiness. Whatever's happening in my life. And so when things are going really, really well, we have what we call church. Yeah, we'll run, we'll break our heels. Amen. Throw our wigs. Praise the Lord. Amen. We got to sit you down. Say, come on. We got to move on to service because I'm happy because something happened to me. And I just want to express that. But the life that God wants to give you is where you will be consistent with how you worship and how you praise God. Let me give you some Bible. I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall come continually be in my mouth and so what happens is when you are not tapped into the part of God that the part of you that's connected to God your praise will always be inconsistent it will always be inconsistent it will always be up and down and up and down and what God is looking for is somebody in here who can give him a praise no matter what if I got money I'm going to praise him if I don't have money, I'm going to praise him. If my honey acts right, I'm going to praise him. If he don't act right, I'm going to praise him. I'll praise him if I don't have a job. I'll praise him if I get a new job. I'll praise him if I got a new car. I'll praise him if I got to catch the bus. I'll praise him if I got a new suit. I'll praise him if I don't have nothing to wear. I'll praise him fat. I'll praise him skinny. I'll praise him when it's raining. What is this with the saints that a little bit of rain can keep you from the presence of God? Is there any consistent praises in here? You ain't consistent. I know you're not consistent because two weeks ago you was running all over this place like you lost your mind. But something happened between this week and last week. But I'm trying to find some consistent praises in here. If that's you, jump up on your feet and give God the praise that is worth his name. I said give God a worthy praise. Is it, is it possible that the inconsistency of the blessings that are flowing in your life is because of the inconsistency of the praise that you give? That you want God to be consistent with you while you be inconsistent with him. That you want him to show up at all times when you got to take your temperature before you show up for him. Oh, Oh, my God. Joy, joy endures hardship. That's why I know it's different from happiness, because happiness can't take nothing. <laughs> happiness can't hold out. Happiness will not last. If you're just building your marriage on happiness, I can already tell you that's going to fail. Oh, my God. Because joy endures hardship. It endures trials because it's connected to meaning and purpose. It can't be stolen. This joy I have. The world didn't give it, so the world can't take it away. You can take my car, but you can't take my joy. You can take my house, but you can't take my joy. You can fire me from the job, but you can't take away my joy because my joy never came from the job anyway. You can leave me and break my heart and I'll still have joy. I'm sad you're gone, but you can't take my joy because you didn't give me joy anyway. Oh, So in our text, here's what the Bible says. Here's what the psalmist is saying. I'm going to show you the path of
of life. Lord, show me the path. Because everything I'm doing is frustrating me. Everything I'm following after is frustrating me. Everything I'm chasing after, chasing, chasing, is frustrating me. Because the only way I know I've been, and, and what's causing this frustration is because we're not seeking him in a correct way. So here's what he says. On thy right hand, in your presence is the fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. I'm going to cut deep here. Y'all ready? Get your pens out. One of the things that has often led to the downfall of many men is the inordinate distraction with pleasure. Inordinate distraction with it. Waking up every day seeking pleasure. I'm not talking about a life void of pleasure because God has given us all things to enjoy, but I'm talking about being driven by it. Where it becomes your focal point, the aim and the pursuit of your whole life is so that I can have pleasure. I wake up every morning just trying to find pleasure. Jesus tells the story of the parable of the sower of the seeds, and he warns that when seeds fell among the thorns, he explained that the thorns were the pursuit of worldly pleasures, and that those worldly pleasures would choke out the word. That many people who start out in the path of God, who start out serving the Lord, who are doing great things for God, get distracted with pleasures, the pleasures of this world. And that those pleasures actually choke out the purpose that God had for your life. And you've seen it, that many good people have been corrupted by the pursuit, for example, of money. Who started out with good ministry, who started out just wanting to help people and bless people, but have gotten distracted with worldly pleasures. That many people who started out in a good path, maybe you're that person, maybe you know somebody who started out really having a sincere heart to serve God's people, to serve the ministry, to do great things, but have gotten somehow distracted with the pleasures. And so it's all about fun. It's all about pleasure. It's all about having a great time. And we've forgotten and gotten off the path to our purpose and Jesus said, it's your inordinate affection and distraction with pleasures that is choking your life, choking your ministry, impacting your family, where you're willing to do anything to have pleasure. Paul wrote this, and I'm going to go deeper. He said, in the last days, that men would be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Isn't that something? Then the last days, we will be so distracted, our priorities will be off, that everything that surrounds our life will be designed around the elusive idea of pleasure and ignoring the fact that God wants us to be, wants him to be worshipped but everything else. What am I saying? We have majored on the minor. We have gotten where we love the gift more than the giver. We have gotten where we love the house more than the one who gave us the house. You've gotten where you worship the gift, the gift to preach, the gift to sing, the gift to play, the gift to serve. You worship the gift more than the giver himself. And so people are distracted with pleasures. He didn't say at all. He said more than lovers of God. Where my pleasure is the priority and God it's a subordinate. And God says, I'm jealous. I'm jealous because the life, the breath that you have to chase the things that you're after, I gave it to you. The house that you brag about so much, I gave it to you. The car you drove out here in, I gave it to you. The ability to do the job that you work on, I gave you the intent, intelligentsia to do the job. And now how dare you worship the intelligence rather than the God who gave you the intelligence. And so we love pleasures more than lovers of 
God. And I know it's true. Anytime our football stadiums and our basketball stadiums and our baseball stadiums are full while our churches are empty, I know that we love pleasures more than worshipers of God. Anytime our movie theaters are packed, with lines down the street to see some loose second rate movie while our, while our churches are empty I know that we are more for pl- anybody ever done it went to a movie and wanted your money back <laughs> my money back but we are lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God somebody say Selah let me go here The spirit of discontentment that lives in our lives can be explained because our priorities are off. The reason why there are so many discontented Christians is because our priorities are off. You think that if I get more stuff that I'll be happier. Puts pressure on our preacher, Charlene, because every Sunday we have to figure out What can I say to make you happy? So what happens is a lot of people are pressured into profit lying. Three days, you're going to be a millionaire. Five weeks, you're going to be a billionaire. God told me you're going to walk out the door and have a Bentley. And we have to make all these promises because we know that it titillates people because we are driven with pleasures. Sister, girl, you have a husband by next month. See, we like to tell you stuff like that. Because we're driven with pleasure. More than lovers of God. My prayer is, God, that I be the kind of person, if that's the message, that's the message. But I want to be the kind of person that tells you what you need to hear, not just what you want to hear. That if you're seeking a pastor to just tickle your ear and tell you everything you want to hear, this may not be the right church for you. I'm going to tell you what you need to hear because I'm more concerned about your spiritual development than I am about your comfort. So write this down. Number one, we need a passion for God's purpose. That's what's missing. That's why so many Christians are discontent with their walk with God. Because your passion, your focus is off. You're not seeking purpose. You're seeking pleasure. You want pleasure rather than purpose. And you're trying to fill a hole in your soul with pleasure rather than purpose. Filling it with more stuff, more people, more men, more experiences. Anything that we think that will make us happy. You don't have to turn here, but look at this in your study time. In Ecclesiastes chapter 2, Solomon starts experimenting with the idea of, can I have pleasure and be happy in this life? So he experiments with all the great distractions that you can have. And here's what he said. He said he denied himself no pleasure. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. He had access and he had the ability, Charlene. He was the king. So he had the money and the resources, and the access to go after anything he wanted. So this is what he did. He, he said, you know, I'm going to check out this whole pleasure thing. He threw himself into great building campaigns, building projects, became a workaholic, expanded his business, increased his staff. And you'll see a lot of people who will work in ordinate amount of hours, not so much because they need the money, but because it gives them a sense of meaning. So sometimes you become a workaholic thinking, if I do more stuff, if I create great projects, I need something to do. I want to build something. I want to create something. I want to make something, but didn't satisfy. And when that didn't work, what he did, he acquired more education. More degrees than a thermometer. Got, than a thermometer. Got, his, got his paper up, Charlene. The Bible said he, he had more money and more land than anybody around him. I'm just going to amass more money. And you see that today. Many people think if I just get more money, more money means more joy. And there are people who amass great amounts of wealth and they're still not happy. So when that didn't work, he, saw, he gained political power. He sought out, look at this, entertainment. Oh, my God, let me hire some more singers. Let me hire some more people to keep me entertained. 
And so even in a city like this in Nashville, where there's entertainment everywhere, you see people running to entertainment trying to fill a hole in their soul. Fill a hole from club to club, from place to place, from here to there, thinking that what I need is more entertainment. I need, I need more things to keep me stimulated. I, I need more stuff to keep me excited. I got to have stuff still coming at me, coming at me, coming at me all the time. And oh God, when that didn't work, he decided to explore sexual pleasures. The Bible said he had over 700 wives. 700. 700. Not girls, 700. JP, 700 wives. He, he had enough wives that there were enough days in the week. He could have two women a day. And still. I'm going to get off of that because y'all looking funny. All the entertainment, all the projects, all the education, all that stuff still didn't fill up the hole. And I'm making fun, but it sounds like some of us. We may not have had as much access to money or resources as Solomon, but we're still doing it on our level as you begin to pull people into your life and pursuing opportunities and pursuing projects and anything that you can to fill up something in you because you sense there's something missing. It's like an itch you can't scratch. Solomon concluded, vanity is vanity. It's all vanity. He says it's empty. It's like trying to catch the wind. The more women I slept with, it was still like trying to catch the wind. The more I drank, the more projects I built, the more degrees I earned, the harder I worked at work, I was still trying to scratch an itch that I just couldn't satisfy. It's empty. It's nothing. The itch that I, because the itch that you're trying to feel is not walking in your purpose. That you could have all of those things, but if you're not walking in your purpose, you'll still be dissatisfied. Jesus said like this in one place. He said that my will, my meat, what feeds me is doing the will of God. Let me ask you a question this morning. What feeds you? What, what fuels you? What gets you up in the morning? What makes you go after your dreams and your goals? If you are trying to fill it with anything outside of God, you will find yourself frustrated. Because the itch you're trying to scratch is not something that can come from the outside. It's something on the inside that knows that I am doing the will of God. I said doing the will of God, not talking about it, not fixing to do it, not trying to sell the idea, not trying to charge $39.99 if you come hear me speak. I'm talking about you knowing that today I got to do what God is telling me to do. When I go to bed tonight, I know that God is pleased with what I did because my, my meat, what feeds me, is doing the will of God. Somebody say amen. Number two, we need, a, we need a passion for God's presence. We need a passion for God's presence. Think of the things and the places that you enjoy going to. The vacation spots or, or the people you like hanging around. When you get to those places, you want that moment to last for life. You know what I mean? If your favorite place is Aruba or Dubai or somewhere in Florida, Destin, something like that, when you're there, you're like, God, I wish I could stay here forever. You're not in a rush to leave, are you? When I'm in some place where I really enjoy, man, I'm like, let this last as long as I can. Here's the problem. When we come into the presence of God, we don't do what I like to call linger. See, see we're in a rush to get out of God's presence. While, while my staff is up here, there's a timer on here because it's being time conscious. And so I believe in being time conscious. Got to get started on time. Got to leave all time. Can't keep them too long because people can't take me so much. So I believe in being time conscious. It don't take God all day to do what he's got to do, Connie. It don't take you 15 hours for God to give you a breakthrough. I don't believe in that. However, what I am concerned about, Adrian, is that when we get in God's presence we don't linger. We don't stay there long enough for God to do what he needs to do. 
that if you was at the beach somewhere, at a party somewhere, and having a good time, you would stay and soak it up and get all that you can out of it. But when it comes to God, while the service is going on, we're looking at our watches saying, when's this going to be over? Our faces look like we're just enduring it. How long they going to sing? How long they going to preach? How long we going to lift our hands? My God, I got to get back to my life. And what we're missing by rushing out of God's presence is an opportunity for God to download, to soak in. That it's not just about me preaching, and it's not just about us playing, and it's not just about us singing. That our whole desire is to create an atmosphere where the glory of God can rest in this place. And when you come in, you become saturated with his presence. Not impressed with our gifts, not impressed with our singing, not impressed with our preaching. When we do the job right, there should be something that lingers on you when you leave church to the point that when you leave, all you're talking about is Jesus. When you leave, you're talking about I had an encounter with God. When you leave, something has happened to you that you're not so quick to get into foolish conversations because I've just been in the presence of God. Not in the presence of men. And maybe that's our problem. Because we're so busy trying to get in the presence of men. Important men, famous men, wealthy men, influential men. That we walk away and never get in the presence of God. And I'm concerned. I'm concerned that we come to our churches looking more for entertainment than we are for edification. That we look for somebody to entertain us rather than edify us. That something about this service should impact you in such a way that you say, I got to get more of that because I want this moment to last for life. My Bible tells me in the book of Exodus that Moses built a tent outside of the camp of Israel because they were showing off, you know. So he built a tent out there and they called the tent the tent of meeting. It was just a ruddy tent that Moses would go out there and God would meet him there. It wasn't grand. It wasn't spectacular. It wasn't special. But he would walk away from the camp and he would go and go out, go and hang out in this tent and he'd have a face-to-face -face meeting with God. And the Bible said that in this tent, God would talk to Moses like a face-to-face, -face, like a man was talking to his friend. Oh, to have a place where I can meet with God and God is talking to me face to face like my friend. Oh, to have a place where I could escape from the cares of the world and the issues on my mind and who don't like me and who do like me, whatever, and just get in God's presence. It's similar to what we call a prayer closet. And the Bible said that the God that sees in secret will reward you openly. That God said when you pray, don't do it out in public. Don't do it where everybody can see you. Go into your secret place, a place alone with God, and let God talk to you and download to you. The problem, many of you, is you're so busy trying to get in people's presence that you don't get in God's presence. Oh, daddy's home. I might as well step on it while I'm here. You're so busy calling me that you don't call him. You're so busy calling your prayer partner that you don't call him. And I hear God saying, I want you to come on in this tent with me. And I'm going to give you instruction. And I'm going to give you direction. Stop trying to follow superstar preachers and get on your knees and talk to your father. I respect gifts. I respect ministries. I respect talents. But some of you are spending money on plane tickets that you could have saved if you went on home and got in your secret closet and talked to God about your situation. That's what Moses had. He had a tent of meeting. When was the last time you had a meeting with God? When was the last time you sat down and had a business meeting with God concerning your finances? Concerning your kids, concerning your marriage, concerning your job. You called everybody, and ain't nobody knowing what to do. But you have not talked to God at all, and he's the one that has the answers to what you need. 
He had to attend a meeting. But that's not the part that blessed me. The part that blessed me was the Bible said that Joshua, who was his servant, would walk into the tent with him, Charlene. He would go into the tent with him. But when Moses would leave the tent and go handle business, Joshua would linger in the tent. Joshua would stay there. The church meeting was over. The business meeting was over. God had already told Moses, gave him instruction. He's gone. But Joshua was still lingering there. Stay in God's presence. It is so intimate. It is so personal that the Bible doesn't even tell us what happened in the tent. It's nowhere recorded what was God saying. We can only speculate. But what I believe is that God was preparing him in secret to be the successor for the ministry. Oh, God. That God was downloading things to him in secret. That while he lingered, is it possible that while you're in a rush to get out of the church and rush to get off the parking lot, that you're missing something that God is trying to download to you in the fellowship, in the worship, in the benediction. Some people run out the door before you can even do the benediction to run back to your quote unquote life. When the life giver is here to give you instruction for your life. Are you with me this morning? Shout on with you. Lift your hand and say, Lord, let me linger. Let me, let me linger. Let me linger in your presence. Everything that we're doing in this church is designed to create an atmosphere that you want to linger. From the music to the singers to the preachers to the service, we're constantly tweaking it and changing it and fussing and pulling our stuff because it's important to me that create atmosphere. Where you leave church feeling like, oh my God, we had church today. Number three, we need a passion for his praise. Oh, no. Not praise for God. I'm talking about praise from God. Can I bring it down? That, that, that we have mastered the art of giving praise to God to the point that we've gotten professional about it. Somebody give God a praise. We start clapping our hands. Somebody give God a shout. We give God a shout. But that's not the motivation. Our motivation should be to get praise from God. To get praise from God. Where God looks at you and celebrates what you're doing with your life. Where he's pleased, where he's excited, where he says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Welcome thou into thy joy of the Lord. Where you do this, let me ask you this. When was the last time you did something that made God celebrate you? <laughs> When was the last time you did something that God said, boy, you did that. Girl, you did that. Girl, you better go ahead. You better do your thing. See, we're up to about giving praise to God, but when was the last time that, that you can honestly say that God has looked at your life and say, oh, man, you are the bomb. You are the bomb. You, you are the bomb. That God is in heaven applauding you. Oh. Let me see if I can explain next this way. My Bible tells me that when Stephen, the deacon, was being stoned to death for preaching the gospel, that while they were stoning him, while they were killing him, while he was suffering, while he was grasping for his last bit of breath, that he looked up into heaven and he saw Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Now understand, Jesus is normally pictured sitting on the right hand of God. But something about watching his deacon suffer for his name made Jesus stand up and give him a standing ovation. Made Jesus get up off his throne and say, boy, you did that. I got to stand up and give you an ovation for that one. I got to stand up and give you a praise. You know how I believe Jesus stood up? Because in that moment, he was acting more like him than anybody else. Because anybody will keep the name when you got things going right. 
Anybody will keep the name if you and honey getting along and you got a new car and you got a new job. But very few people will keep the name when your life starts suffering. And not just suffering, but he suffered without complaint. Without fussing about it. Without crying about it. Without complaining about it. See, the saints get on my nerves because they can't take nothing nowadays. Nowadays, any kind of inconvenience, anything that just makes them income, child, my back hurt, child, y'all want too much of my time, child. The early Christians were being stoned for the name of the Lord, and they kept on serving God. You can't take it if somebody talk out your name. If somebody talk about you, I'm not going back to that church because they talking about me. And the early Christians were being stoned to death, calling on the name of the Lord. When was the last time that you suffered indignity, that you suffered wrongdoing simply because it was right and you wanted to please God? Could have went off. Could have showed out. Jesus could have called legions of angels to help him on the cross. But the Bible said that he suffered, that he endured the suffering, that he took the suffering. And so because he was willing to suffer, the Bible said, wherefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. God gave him an exalted position. God blessed him because he was willing to suffer. Can I be transparent for a minute? You'd be surprised the number of people, Connie, that I blessed, that I helped, that I gave opportunities to, that I recommended them for great things, Andrea. Andrea. That open doors for them and say, you know what? This person right here would be good for that. You should call them, put their name in the hat, bless them. And those same people I knew were talking about me. Then while I was recommending them, say, you know what? You should use so and so. They're really, really good. Why? Why? I was blessing them and they didn't even know it Andrea they didn't even know that I knew that they was talking about me but I did it because I wanted to be a blessing I did it because it was right I did it because God was watching me I did it because God wanted to see what I was going to do I did it because he told me to and it didn't have nothing to do with how I felt about them personally this is what God told me to do for you Will you bless and not curse? See, some of y'all couldn't have took that. And I believe that God trusts people with resources and with opportunity and leadership when he knows that what you're supposed to do won't be affected by your personal feelings. That I can send you somewhere and you will preach because I told you to preach and not because somebody is going to give you whatever they're going to give you. It's a test. Some of you right now are being tested on your job. I just want to see what you're going to do. I want to see if I can trust you with more responsibility, with more leadership. The last thing I need in leadership is another Saul, some egomaniac who can't control his emotions. So I got to test you in small things. Somebody right now, you can't drive across town. Child, that's too far. I can't go that far for Jesus. But the God is just testing you. <laughs> he, he's testing you. He's testing me. Because I want to I have a passion for his praise. It's in those moments that I knew that they were mistreating me, but I blessed them anyway that I believe that God was the most pleased with me. Greater than preaching, greater than hooping. Greater than putting together a great sermon, it's those times when I'm looking at the person and they didn't even know I knew. <laughs> they didn't even know that I knew. I knew exactly what you said. I knew what you said and when you said it and who you said it to because people can't keep nothing. I knew that you said it. I knew that you did it. I knew that you was in the crowd that was trying to kill me, but I wanted to bless you anyway. I still recommended you. I still referred you. I still opened the door for you. I still blessed you. And it is in those moments that I believe that heaven stood up and said, boy, you did that. 
You did that. You could have cussed them out. You could have slapped them. You could have said, meet me in the parking lot. You could have shot off a Facebook post. You could have shot off an email, but you resisted it because you trusted me more than you were worried about them. And it's in those moments that God is saying, Some of y'all, you keep flunking the test because you got to have get back. You got to get revenge. You kill my dog, I kill your cat. And you rob yourself of an opportunity for God to see you stand strong. It's when you stand strong in the face of adversity that God is pleased with you. Is there anybody in here who made up your mind, I'm going to stand strong? They mistreated me, but I'm going to stand. They lied on me, but I'm going to stand. They talked about me, but I'm going to stand. Christians can't take nothing now and then. They didn't invite me to the party. They didn't call my name. They didn't remember me. They didn't come see about me. Oh, shut up. I need God to give me praise. Not you. I need God. God. It's the moments that I've been the most inconvenienced that God has been the most pleased. It's it's the times I came to church and I didn't feel like coming, but I came anyway. It's the times that I took a seat 20 rows back in an empty room (laughs) and decided to give God praise anyway. It's the times when I determined If I get there, I'm not going to say anything. But when I got there, I decided to give God praise anywhere. I got death in my family, but I'm praising him anyway. My car is acting up right now, but I'm praising God anyway. My kids are not acting right, but I'm praising God anyway. See, this generation don't know nothing about this, but we used to give God an anyhow praise back in the day. Anybody know anything about an anyhow praise? We gave God an anyhow praise. Anyhow praise meant that you could have everything going wrong, but somewhere down on the inside, I gave God praise anyway because it wasn't what was going on on the outside. It was something down on the inside. If there's anybody that got something down on the inside, jump on your feet and give God a praise and pull that thing out. I said pull it out. I said pull it out. I said pull it out. It's not going to come out of your flesh. It's going to come out of your spirit. Here's where the challenge is. Whenever we get ready to do something for God, whether it's serve or give or come or preach, we always consult our flesh first to see how I feel about it. And if I feel feel like coming, then I'll come. If I feel like going to church, then I'll come. If I feel like it. And you keep consulting your feelings. But that's why your life is like this. That's why your life is up and down like this. That's why you're on an emotional roller coaster all the time. Because you keep waiting for things to smooth out before you praise him. But I'm going to tell you the secret. You got to praise him even before things smooth out. You got to praise him anyway. You got to serve anyway. Away with these leaders who only want to serve when they're the ones that's getting to shine. As long as they're getting to shine, they're getting attention, they're being put up front, I'm going to support. But when it comes to supporting other people, you don't show up. Because you have to be consistent because this is my church. And it's not always about me. Sometimes it's about somebody else. I'm going to push you. I'm going to encourage you. And what we need in church are people who are tapped into something consistent. This message today is not designed to excite your flesh. I have to hold my mule to be quite honest because there's something in me that always wants to flip the switch and go into something else. But that's part of the problem. Because we keep trying to get your flesh to react. But what I'm trying to tell you is beyond your flesh. It's beyond your feelings. It's beyond what happened today. It's beyond spectacularism. It's beyond emotionalism. I'm trying to get you to tap into something that doesn't change. 
You might walk out here tomorrow and run into bad news. And I'm trying to get somebody ready for it because what God is trying to unlock in you will not change no matter what you face on this week. So here's my close. David said that the joy of the Lord is my strength. You keep trying to get your, your strength from your flesh and from your friends and chasing women and chasing men. And after all that and going out on dinners and trying to get dates. And then you realize after a while, all the dates start looking the same. <laughs> but so many restaurants you can go to. But what I'm talking about is tapping into something that won't change, that can't be altered. And when I get ready to pull strength, I don't pull it out of my flesh. I don't pull it out of my bank account. I don't pull it out of my phone list. I pull it out of my relationship with God because the joy of the Lord is my strength. Throw your hands in the air and say, I need strength, Lord. So in the 30 seconds I got, I'm going I'm to push you into something. I want to push you into something. Stand up on your feet. I want to push you into something. I want to push you into something. What I'm talking about is not something that you can get on the external. You can't go buy this. You can't go to the store and pick this up. You, you can't just jump on a plane and go somewhere and find a happy place. What I'm talking about, if you get this, you can ring this up anytime you want. That means two o'clock in the morning, you can't find nobody to pray for you. You can reach down and pull this up on your way to a job that's getting on your nerves. You can pull this up. This means when you and honey ain't quite getting along, you can pull this up. Oh my God. This means when you get a bill you can't pay and don't know what you're going to do about it, you're not going to lose your joy. I'm going to reach down into something and pull this up. This what I'm trying to tap you into is joy. She gets it. So listen, for the, for the next 30 seconds, I want you to lift your hand begin to worship right here. 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 What I'm trying to get to come out of you is something only God can give you. Can't nobody take no credit for this. Only God can give you this. This is the strength you're going to need to raise those kids. This is the strength you're going to need to get through this next test. This is the strength you're going to need. I know your money is tight. And you almost didn't come today because you got bad news. But this is the strength that you're going to need to overcome this next test. Lift your hands, begin to worship right here. Somebody's bored, somebody's sleeping. But I want to push somebody to tap in. God said it's already in you. It's already there. I just need you to tap in. The anointing that you need to break the yoke in your life is already there if you just tap in. How do I tap in? I begin to worship him. I begin to praise him. I begin to magnify him. I begin to forget about these people that are here. And I begin to tap into God. This is not about the pastor. This is not about the praise team. This is not about my neighbor. This is not about my enemies. This is about me tapping into God. You can't do God's work without God's presence. It don't work. Come on, let's go in. Come on, church, let's go in. Come on, let's just go in. Let's go in. Take off your titles. Take off your position. Take off what you thought, what you feel, and what you got to have. And just get in God's presence and begin to worship him until glory comes in the room. God promised me if I preach this message right, that glory will come in the room. I want glory to come in the room. I'm not asking you how you feel. I'm asking you, are you tapped into the glory? I need everybody reaching out. I need everybody seeking God's face. I need everybody saying I need a touch. Come on, don't rush out of this presence. Don't rush out of this presence. Linger here. Let God touch you. Let God talk to you. Let God speak to you. We're so spoiled. We're so spoiled. We're always looking for people, but we're not looking for him. And God said, I want you looking for me. Tap in, tap in, tap in, tap in, tap in, tap in. You got to tap into something deeper. There's something deeper you need. Hallelujah. All the trips you took, you still ain't satisfied. All the sex you done had, you still ain't satisfied. All the drinking you've been doing, you still ain't satisfied. All the places you ain't been. 
but God said, if you tap in, if you get this, the water I give you, you will never thirst again. The water I give you, you won't be seeking for another man or another woman or another hit or another drink. The water. You ain't getting no water. You got to go deeper than that. You got to go deeper than that. You got to push past your flesh. You got to push past how you feel. You got to push past bad news. You got to push past what somebody said. 